The wind howled as I hid behind the trees on the side of the house. I hate the cold, I muttered, but there was nothing I could do but endure it. This had to be done, regardless of the weather. The home security system looked good, but after years of working in construction, I knew a thing or two about how such systems are installed and how to hack them without causing an alarm. It only took me a couple of minutes of work. Opening the window, I threw out my tools and pulled out the machine gun I had bought at a gun show in Reno. I took a deep breath. The time has come. Hey, Andy, look at this, my wife said, handing me a glossy brochure. I saw that it was a commercial for Paradiso, a new luxury resort that was set to open in two weeks on the Gulf Coast. And what? I asked. So what? She unfolded the brochure, revealing an invitation for the coming weekend. It looks quite expensive, I noted skeptically. Oh, rest assured, she said with a laugh. It will be very expensive once the place opens. But this invitation is intended to be a pre-opening, a sort of test cruise to sort things out, with inconsistencies before paying customers arrive. Our agency is advertising the resort, which is why I received the invitation. It will be good for us and it won't cost us a cent. I was prepared to object because my football club was scheduled to play a match that Saturday. But Felicia's last words made me stop. After eight years of our marriage, we hit a rough patch, nothing serious but quite unpleasant, and we were both aware of it. Part of the problem, of course, was my construction company, which had been desperately struggling to survive since the Great Recession began. We had some hard times. We even had to sell our house and move into a small condominium to reduce our monthly expenses. But we survived, and now business is picking up, making all that effort worth it. Thank God Felicia has a job. She was the vice president of the largest public relations firm in Orlando, and her ability to move seamlessly between the Anglo and Latino communities made her a rising star. Her face and figure showed the best of Cuban features. I'm Cuban too, but I'll be the first to admit that Felicia looks much better than me. If anything, her income kept us afloat during the deep recession, but her success also placed increasingly greater demands on her. Late nights and long hours became all too common. All this caused us to lose some of the excitement that enlivened our marriage. We used to spend whole weekends in bed with each other. Lately, it's good if we find the strength for quick sex in the evening. We agreed on the need for change and even discussed ways to spice up our personal lives, but we haven't done anything yet. So when Felicia suggested we spend a long weekend together at this new resort, it occurred to me that this might be just what we needed to freshen up our marriage. It's nice that she was the one who suggested this. Besides, there really was nothing urgent in the office, and my football compañeros could do without their midfielder for one game. Having accepted the invitation, we packed our bags on Wednesday evening. It was a real treat to see Felicia pull out her skimpiest bikini along with some hotter lingerie. She's really going out of her way, I thought. On Thursday, we left work early. We drove west until we got to the PC Learn, and then drove north through Florida past Crystal River until we saw the turnoff signs for the resort. Damn it, I exclaimed. This place is in the middle of nowhere. Why did they need to build a resort here? That's the answer, Felicia said. Developers believe there is a potentially lucrative but untapped market in Gainesville. They hope to attract wealthy University of Florida alumni to attend home football games. It's hard to find a place to stay close to campus. Why not head to a beautiful seaside resort just an hour's bus ride from the stadium? The resort has no competitors. To find something comparable, you have to go all the way to Clearwater. I winked at her. You are a very good PR woman, I said with a smile. I can be very convincing when I want. Once we got to the resort, I was impressed. In addition to a number of beach cottages with all the amenities, the resort offered a high-rise hotel. Our room was on the eighth floor, and I loved that Felicia was able to snag an ocean view room. We unpacked our bags, then I called the front desk. By the time we had changed into our swimsuits and sat on the veranda, a smiling young man brought us two mojitos. As we basked in the setting sun, watching the waves roll in, 
I sat back and took a long sip of my drink. That was a great idea, Corazon. How much would all this cost if we paid for it? I asked. Let's just say you'll have to build a lot more buildings before we can afford to stay here at full price, she said with a grin. By the time we finished our second mojito, feeling completely relaxed, I looked from the beach to my wife's bikini and started to get ideas. But when I pulled my chair closer to her and started stroking her neck, she shooed me away with feigned irritation. Hold on, Tigre, she said with a smile. It's time for us to get ready for dinner. There are two different restaurants here at the resort, and I want to see if they are as good as the owners say. Then she ran her fingers over my chest. But if after dinner you're still in shape? Before I could grab her, she jumped back towards the shower stall, which was large enough for two. Maybe we can try it this weekend, I thought. This already looked like a very good start. After my shower and dressed for dinner, I sat in front of the huge flat-screen TV to watch Mexican football while she did her makeup and got dressed. Well, do you approve? She wore a white silk dress that seemed to flow over her body like water, outlining her curves. The jet black hair was cut very short, but styled in a completely feminine way. An obsidian necklace hung around her neck, and her four-inch heels allowed her to stand an inch taller than me. Magnifica, that was all I could say. We chose the American Grill for our first meal, and it did not disappoint. As we shared a slice of cheesecake for dessert, Felicia remarked, I think this place goes very well with the grills we had in Miami. I couldn't agree with her more. When we finished, we walked hand in hand to the hotel nightclub, where a Latin American orchestra was playing salsa. Felicia was a better dancer than me, but I enjoyed simply following her, admiring her sinuous movements. How anyone could dance in four-inch heels was beyond me, but Felicia's dance was both graceful and sensual. I couldn't help but be proud of the admiring glances from both men and women. I dragged her off the dance floor, pretending to be tired. If we don't stop now, I won't have the strength left for you in the room, I told her. She quickly grabbed my hand and pulled me towards the door. Oh no, she said. I have big plans for today. We kissed and hugged while going up in the elevator, but when we entered the room, she stopped me. No lights, she commanded, just the moon over the ocean. I turned around. She was standing in the center of the room, facing me. She gave me a sultry smile, then extended her hand and did something with her fingers. Suddenly, the white silk dress slid down her body and flowed at her feet, revealing a thin bra and tiny thong made of the same white lace. She stepped out of her dress, still wearing her heels, and walked toward me like a model on a runway. We made love. The next morning, I went to the beach for a run, and when I got back and showered, Felicia and I went down for breakfast. That same day, we toured the estate, and what I saw made an impression. I was still not sure that this venture was financially viable, but there was no doubt that the management intended to treat their guests to a first-class holiday. Later, Felicia tried a massage at the spa while I swam in the pool. She came back tired, so we both took a nap after lunch. It was late when we woke up, and by the time Felicia put on her little black dress, the Continental Restaurant was full. We had just resigned ourselves to the idea of returning to the American Grill when a man sitting with a woman at the next table waved to us. He stood up and walked over. I couldn't help but notice that you didn't find the place. I'm Don Cavendish, and this is my wife Mia. If you don't mind having lunch with strangers, we'd love for you to join us. I looked at Felicia questioningly, and she nodded encouragingly, so I shook his hand. Don, I'm Andy Salazar, and this is my wife Felicia. We will be glad to accept your kind invitation. As I approached the table, I looked at them. They were definitely an attractive couple. He was an Englishman about my height, maybe a few years older than Felicia and I. Mia wasn't a trophy wife but she was definitely beautiful. Her dress had an intriguing neckline that drew all eyes to her impressive breasts. To be frank, she was beautifully built and proud of it. We started chatting about ourselves and the resort. Don and Mia had just arrived from Oakley, so we were able to tell them a little bit about what we found. After this, the conversation moved on to a wide variety of topics, and by the time the tiramisu arrived, I was surprised to realize that dinner had flown by. 
Don insisted on treating us to a cordial after dinner, and when the glasses were passed around, proposed a toast to making new friends in unexpected places. We all joined him wholeheartedly. When we finished, Don wasn't ready for the evening to end. I heard they have a great little nightclub here. What do you say if we dance a couple of times? I looked at Felicia and she smiled at me. Sounds good, Don, I told him, and we went. The nightclub was packed when we got there, but I mustn't have slipped someone something because a table magically appeared for the four of us. After we ordered our drinks, Don stood up and bowed to me. Do you mind if I ask your beautiful wife to dance? He asked. Only if you let me do the same with yours, I replied, and Mia looked at me encouragingly. The band was playing classic rock tonight, and all four of them started jumping and moving to the beat. After the first dance, we switched partners and continued for two more dances before returning to our table to finish our drinks. I leaned towards Felicia. Are you ready to leave yet? I asked. As far as I remember, we had unfinished business in our room. She nodded, we apologized, and prepared to leave. Don and I gave each other a manly hug. Then he hugged Felicia and I did the same with Mia. It seemed to me that she hugged a little tighter than simple friendship required, but not that I minded. Then, as we set off, Don spoke again. Could you join us tomorrow at 11 E? We are staying in one of the beach cottages and are going to eat on the patio. How about this? I turned to Felicia. I really like Don and Mia, she whispered, and I'd like to take a look at one of those beach cottages. If you are sure that we are not imposing ourselves on you, I said, we will be happy to come. We headed to the elevator. What a pleasant surprise! Felicia exclaimed. One minute we were sitting with complete strangers, and the next minute we were dancing with old friends. I felt the same, I told her, opening the door with my key. What do you think about Mia? I thought she was very nice, Felicia said, starting to undress. But I didn't have the opportunity to talk to her in detail. Then she turned and gave me a cheeky smile. But I know exactly what you thought about her. You couldn't take your eyes off her breasts. I tried to deny it, but Felicia didn't want to hear anything. Well, I think now it's time for you to pay attention to this couple. Mine may not be as big as Mia's, but I think they'll respond very sweetly if you kiss them. It was the perfect excuse to scoop my wife into my arms and lay her down on the big bed. Neither food nor dancing prevented us from making very pleasant love. It was late morning when we arrived at Don and Mia's cottage. The brunch they prepared was truly impressive, and lunch on the large, screened-in porch at the back of their cottage was delicious, especially with the breeze from the ceiling fans helping to cool us down. By this time, we all felt very comfortable with each other, so when Felicia and Mia wanted to sunbathe next to the infinity pool, I was not surprised. Don had another idea and invited me to join him on their deep-sea fishing yacht. Even though I've lived in Florida my whole life, I've done very little deep-sea fishing, and I couldn't wait to go with him. We headed to the dock, where his 38-foot cruiser, the Chris Craft, was moored. Don took a chest full of beer and ice and asked me to take a couple of cans of gas. When you're in the ocean, you don't have enough beer or gas, he said with a laugh. Once we were a few miles into the bay, Don pulled out our rods and baited our lines. Beer and sea air made for a pleasant day. Don was an interesting guy, and if the cottage and yacht weren't enough, his stories soon made it clear that he and Mia were quite wealthy. Suddenly my rod bent double, and the line began to whistle off the reel. You have something? Don shouted and helped me grab the fishing rod. He then got behind the wheel and began steering the cruiser to help me pull the rod towards him. I thought I was in pretty good physical shape, but it took all of my strength just to stay in the boat. Suddenly Don shouted, Here she is! And I saw a blue and white torpedo jump out of the water. What is it? I shouted and Don came up and slapped me on the back. If I'm not mistaken, you caught a mako shark, Andy. The fish jumped several more times trying to free itself, but I slowly pulled it up to the boat. As she approached, I was amazed at how big she was. I turned to Don. Are we really going to try to put him away? I asked, but before Don could answer, the shark bit the line and swam away. Don tried to console me after losing my shark. 
But to be honest, I was glad I didn't have to go near that monster. I was exhausted and ready to head back to shore. When I returned to our room, I was eager to tell Felicia about my great adventure, and she listened with pleasure. But I sensed she had something on her mind, and when I finished my Who Got story, she jumped at the opportunity. I also had a little adventure today, she said, with an expression that I didn't quite understand. Mia and I had a very interesting conversation by the pool. She said that she and Don like to switch things up sometimes. I don't understand, I said, confused. What do they like to change? Felicia looked at me like I was a naive child. No, Andy, they like to change partners for sex. Oh, oh, I said as soon as I understood. Wow, I would never have thought that. But that's not all, Felicia continued with a slight smile. Mia asked if we would like to switch with them today. I sat down abruptly on the bed. It was too much to begin with. We just met them, and now they're asking us to have sex? Mia was certainly attractive enough, but I still thought this was the weekend for Felicia and I to reconnect. I don't know, honey. I mean, I really like them, but it's kind of unexpected. What do you think? Now it was Felicia's turn to sit next to me. I think we can do this. We've been talking about trying something like this for a long time, and we'll never have a better opportunity than now. We don't know these people very well, and we live in different cities. We are not going to encounter them all the time. Besides, you have to admit that Mia is pretty hot. When she said this, I couldn't help but remember how Mia looked in a bikini before Don and I went fishing. The thought of being with a new woman after so many years suddenly seemed very attractive to me. However, I wanted to be sure of Felicia's feelings. Corazon, are you sure? We have a wonderful weekend together, and I would be happy to completely focus all my time and attention on you, I said, taking her hands in mine. Let's do this, she said, squeezing my hands to emphasize her words. It will be an adventure, something that will enliven our relationship and bring us closer. If it turns out that we don't like it, no one will force us to repeat it. I saw that she had already made up her mind, and to be honest, the more I thought about Mai, the more I was attracted to her. The way she pressed herself against me when we danced, and some of the things she said now took on a new light. The fact that such a sexy woman was interested in me certainly stimulated me. I tried to hide my growing impatience. Okay, if that's what you want, so do I. Needless to say, when we met Don and Mia for dinner, the atmosphere was very tense. It was immediately clear that both women were dressed to impress. Felicia in red and Mia in black. Both dresses did more than just hint at the delights that lay underneath. As we were shown to our table in the restaurant, Felicia sat next to Don and Mia slid next to me. We were all feeling a little dizzy, and the waiter must have realized something was going on, even though we tried to be discreet. By the end of the dinner, I was ready to take it to the next level, but the ladies wanted to dance first, and Don and I reluctantly agreed. The orchestra played mostly slow jazz that evening, and the dancing became a prelude with music. Eventually, both ladies decided to visit the ladies' room together, and Don and I sat down at our table to finish our drinks. He leaned over, handed me his key, and said quietly, Why don't you and Mia use our cottage tonight, and Felicia and I will go to your room? We can all meet for breakfast tomorrow morning. I nodded, gave him the key, and took one last sip of my mojito. Just at this time, both ladies returned, laughing and looking at us with burning eyes. I think it's time to go, Mia said, taking my hand. I looked back to catch Felicia's eye. Have fun, Corazon, I said, and she smiled at me. And you too, Andy. As Mia and I walked to her beach cottage, we clung to each other like teenagers in love, whispering and giggling at each other's innuendos. But when we went inside, Mia turned into a tigress. I looked at her. Her feminine curves and protruding breasts made a delightful contrast to my wife's slender, athletic body, and we had sex. The next thing I remember, Mia was shaking me. Wake up, love. We'll be late for breakfast. I clumsily rolled out of bed and began to pull on my somewhat wrinkled clothes. As we approached the main building, she took my arm. You were great last night, Andy, 
Someday, we'll have to do this again. Exactly, Mia, I replied. But the truth was that, now that our night of love was over, I was starting to worry about Felicia and how her night had gone. Sex with Mia was great, but now I needed to know how my wife felt. When we entered the restaurant, Felicia and Don were already seated. Hello, sleepyhead, Felicia said with a smile. We were already beginning to doubt that you would ever get up. I even ordered breakfast for you. She leaned over and kissed me quickly. Did everything go well for you yesterday? I asked quietly. She nodded. Everything was amazing. What about you? It was good, I told her. Maybe we can talk about this later. Of course, but first you better eat. You look exhausted. I smiled shyly and started eating breakfast. While eating, we discussed our plans for the day. Mia wanted to take Felicia and me on a boat. Don was unable to join us because he had to go to the small office his company maintained in Crystal River to attend the conference, but he convinced us to go without him. Mia is as good a sailor as I am. She went on the yacht many times without me, he said. The weather was beautiful, so another boat ride seemed nice, and watching two beautiful women in bikinis would be appealing too. So Felicia and I went to our room to change clothes. But as we rode up the elevator, I felt myself becoming increasingly sleepy. When I continued to yawn, Felicia laughed. Mia must have really tired you out last night, she said cheerfully, and I had to admit that I barely slept. Why don't you lie down and take a little nap, Felicia suggested. Looks like you really need some rest. Mia and I can do without you. I really wanted to go with them, but I could barely keep my eyes open. I plopped down on the bed and closed my eyes. Felicia kissed my cheek and headed for the door. I'll put up a do not disturb sign, she said. Sleep well, Andres. The next thing I heard was a knock on the door and a voice shouting, Salazar, Mr. Salazar, are you here? I tried to sit up, but the knocking continued. Just a minute, I shouted. I'll get up now. What time is it now? I asked myself, and looking at the clock on the bedside table, I was shocked to see that it was almost four o'clock in the afternoon. The knocking resumed, drawing my attention again. Shaking my head to clear it, I rose to my feet and walked unsteadily towards the door. When I opened it, I saw a hotel employee with a worried expression on his face. We've been looking everywhere for you, Mr. Salazar. We called the room, but no one answered. I must have been fast asleep, I said. What's the matter? Why are you looking for me? He pulled me by the sleeve almost dragging me towards the elevator. There was an accident, he said breathless. You must come urgently. His words sent a surge of adrenaline through me, and I finally began to fully wake up. But in spite of my repeated inquiries, the man told me nothing except that there had been an accident and that I should go with him. When we got to the main floor, he led me outside to where a bunch of uniformed men stood. I found him, the employee shouted. I found Mr. Salazar. What's happened? I asked in despair. What's happening? A man in a Coast Guard uniform pointed toward the bay. At first, peering into the distance, I could not see anything. But then I noticed what looked like a helicopter circling around a faint column of smoke. I don't understand, I managed, as fear tightened my throat. Another officer picked up the iPad. I couldn't figure out what I was looking at, but it seemed to be a video. This is a live broadcast from a helicopter, the man said, and I stared in horror at the picture of burning debris floating in the sea. Looks like there was an explosion and fire. What kind of boat was that? I asked in fear. As far as we can tell, it was a Chris Craft heavy cruiser, he said, and my knees went weak. I swallowed and tried to carefully formulate my next question. What about the survivors? Was anyone saved? He looked at me sadly. The helicopter did not find any life-saving equipment, and the diver they lowered did not find any bodies in the water. Then, perhaps seeing the look on my face, he added, But we'll send a boat over from Marine Safety in Tampa now, so they can do a more thorough search. An unbidden memory of Mako the shark flashed through my mind. I shuddered and tried to erase this image from my imagination. What could have done this? I asked, pointing to the broadcast from the helicopter. Looks like a bomb exploded. The officer shook his head. We see things like this happen too often. 
Something goes wrong in the boat's engine compartment and it fills with smoke. Then, when someone tries to start the engine, an explosion occurs. This is how many boatmen die. At that moment, his radio began to crackle and he stopped to talk. When he finished, he turned to me again. Our cruiser is now in place to continue the search. Now there is nothing you can do. Why don't you go back and wait in your room so we can find you if we have any more news? I didn't want to leave, but I didn't want to stay there either, so I turned to go back into the house. Behind me, someone quickly said, Poor people, and my heart sank even lower. If the professionals are so pessimistic, what hope can I have? I spent the rest of the day waiting, but never received a call. After a while, I started calling myself, first to my office to say I would be gone on Monday, then to my sister, and finally to the one I feared the most. Felicia's parents. It was terrible. Later, there was a knock on the door, and when I opened it anxiously, I saw a waiter with a tray of food. The manager thought you might like a snack, sir, he told me. I gave him a tip and asked him to thank the manager for his concern, but although I had not eaten anything since breakfast, I had no appetite. Every few minutes I got up and went out onto the balcony to look out over the bay. Although it was already dark, I was still hoping to see the lights of a helicopter or perhaps a rescue boat heading our way. But alas, nothing happened. Due to anxiety and a long sleep, I couldn't fall asleep. So to keep myself busy, I started packing our things. As I bent down to pick something up from the floor, I noticed a piece of lace under the bed. They were Felicia's panties, and when I lifted them, I saw that the crotch was crusty. Suddenly the memory of yesterday's sex games came back to me with full force, and I was overwhelmed with shame. Instead of being with my wife, I spent the last night of her life with another woman. This in turn made me think of poor, passionate Mia. She was probably dead too. If only I had been with them. I could have done something to prevent the accident or perhaps save them. Then a wave of indignation washed over me. If Mia hadn't worn me out, I would have been there with them and might have been able to save Felicia. Then my thoughts turned to Don, and I realized that he must be experiencing the same torment as me. I collapsed on the bed and cried, my emotions constantly changing from guilt to grief, from anger to despair. It was the worst night of my life. As I lay there, I continued to remember the details of my life together with Felicia. We both attended Florida Atlantic University in Boca Raton and played football. That's how we met. One day after training, she came up to me and started talking about tactics. She looked really good in her soccer shorts and tank top and I couldn't take my eyes off her. We dated for the last two years of college and got married right after graduation. I began to understand Felicia better after meeting her family. Her parents, as I learned, were ardent anti-communists. My father's family owned a sugar plantation in Cuba when Batista was in power. But after Fidel Castro's revolution came to power in 1959, landowners eventually lost their plantations and were forced to work their own fields. In desperation, her grandparents left the island on a small boat and arrived in Miami penniless. Felicia's mother was born in Miami and grew up in extreme poverty. She and her husband, Felicia's father, both worked low-level jobs so Felicia could go to college. As a result, Felicia was absolutely obsessed with success. Once when we were dating, she told me that after seeing how her grandfather and parents were forced to live, she vowed that she would never be poor again. This memory made me feel even worse about the way our life together had turned out. The 2008 housing crisis was particularly bad for Florida, and my thriving construction company suddenly found itself on the brink of bankruptcy. For a while, we had to stop all new construction, and for a couple of years, we struggled to survive on renovation work. Felicia and I were forced to sell our home and move into a small condominium just to survive. I felt like a failure, but Felicia never complained. Her support, both emotional and financial, was critical to our survival and our lives began to recover. And now I may never have the chance to truly express my love and gratitude to her. We both neglected church in college, but now, on long nights, I repeated all the Ave Marias and Pater Noster, my childhood, asking for a miracle. This was all I had left. 
I must have dozed off towards morning because I was awakened by a quiet knock on the door. When I rushed to open it, there was another Coast Guard officer standing there. For a moment, hope flared within me, but the solemn expression on his face quickly quelled it. I'm very sorry, Mr. Salazar, but the decision has been made to stop searching for survivors, he said in an emotionless voice. But you can't do that, I shouted. It's light now, and it will be easier to find them. You must keep looking. He shook his head patiently. Mr. Salazar, our boats have special radar to search the surface of the water, and our helicopters have infrared scanners to search for heat signatures. We combed the area all night. If there was something or someone there, we would have found it already. I must have had a stubborn look on my face because he continued, Sir, I've investigated a lot of boat explosions, but this was one of the worst I've seen. It is extremely unlikely that either of the two passengers survived the first explosion and fire. Then, seeing the ashen expression on my face, he reached out to grab my shoulder. It is also extremely unlikely that any of them suffered. The explosion was strong enough to blow the boat to pieces. Well, they probably didn't feel anything. I wanted to scream. I wanted to get them back on the water and find my Felicia. I wanted to die myself, but I just stood there and looked at the floor. Finally, I looked up at him. Thank you, officer, for doing everything you could, I said. He shook my hand, turned, and solemnly left. I closed the door and sank to the floor. I don't know how long I lay there, but I jumped when I heard another knock on the door. When I opened it, two men in uniform were standing outside. Salazar? asked one of them. When I nodded, he asked again, Andres Salazar? Yes, I said. It's me. Who are you? He reached into his pocket and pulled out his ID. We're from the Citrus County Sheriff's Department. We'd like to talk to you about what happened in the bay yesterday. Okay, I said obediently. Come in. It was the last thing I wanted to do right now, but I thought there was probably going to be some kind of official police investigation. We sat down in the living room, and the deputy asked, where were you when the accident happened? The question seemed strange to me, and I did not like the way he emphasized the word accident, but I told him that I was in the room between breakfast and four o'clock in the evening. It's six o'clock, he said. What were you doing in your room all this time? I took a nap, I said, my irritation growing. You must have had a lot of fun last night, he said with a grin. I just stared at him. Did anyone see you while you were napping? The sheriff's deputy asked sardonically. Controlling myself, I managed to answer. As far as I know, no. I slept all the time. So there is no one who could confirm your location between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., right, Salazar? He said, drawing out the syllables in a mocking drawl. I stood up abruptly. I've heard that condescending tone before. This hadn't happened in a long time, but he still had the ability to touch a nerve. South Florida is heavily Latino. In fact, nearly 60% of Dade County's population is Hispanic, with nearly half of them foreign-born. But as you move north, this percentage drops sharply, and, especially in rural areas, it is not uncommon to encounter some of the same old prejudices. But that didn't mean I had to accept it. What does all of this mean? My wife just died in a terrible accident and you're asking questions like, I'm a criminal suspect, I said angrily. You were the one who used the term suspect, said another officer. That was the last straw. I was so furious. Officers, I know my rights and I'm not going to answer any more questions without a lawyer, I said firmly. The two men looked at each other. The first one closed the notepad. I assume you know what it's like, Senor Salazar. Sounds like a U.S. citizen who knows his constitutional rights, I snapped. He shrugged and both headed towards the door. Okay, then we'll meet you and your lawyer tomorrow at the Citrus County Sheriff's Office in Inverness, he said, and walked out. It took me a few minutes to calm down. Then I grabbed the phone and called Jose Pasco, my lawyer in Orlando. When I told his secretary who was calling, she connected me immediately. Andy, he said answering the phone. We were all shocked when we heard the news. Please accept my deepest condolences on the passing of your beautiful wife. 
The bad news was not long in coming, I thought. That's why I'm calling José. I'm still here at the Paradiso Resort, and I've just been questioned by two bigots from the local sheriff's department, as if I were a criminal suspect. I am here in an English-speaking country, and I think I urgently need a lawyer. Look, I'm sure this is all just a misunderstanding, but just in case, we need to find you someone local, someone who's in court. Let me make a few phone calls and I'll call you back. I thanked him and plopped down in a chair. I could feel the pain throbbing in my head. This nightmare was getting worse every minute. About an hour later, the phone rang, and I answered impatiently. It was Jose. I have good and bad news. Let me start with the bad. How well did you know Don and Mia Cavendish? He asked me. We only met them this weekend. Well, Mia Cavendish is the former Mia Reynolds. Her father is one of the richest and most powerful men in Marion County. He owns the largest thoroughbred horse farm in Ocala. The bottom line is that none of the major Central Florida law firms will touch your case. They all depend on Mr. Reynolds, he told me. Crap, I exclaimed. So what should I do now? Why? Well, the good news is that I have found a lawyer in Inverness who will represent you. Her name is Gina Ellerby. The bad news is that she is quite young and inexperienced, but several people in the area recommended her, he explained. I'm sure she'll do a great job with your case. Okay, I said. If you think she can protect me from the fanatics, then that's enough for me. Okay, he replied, because I've already contacted her office. She'll meet you there at the resort in the morning, and the two of you can drive to Inverness to meet with the sheriff's department. I'm sure you and her will work things out. He paused. And again, Andy, I'm so sorry for your loss. Please let me know if there is anything else I can do to help. Thank you, Jose, I answered with difficulty. My emotions were raw. Any reminder seemed likely to set them in motion. Resort management called a little later to tell me I could stay an extra night if I needed it, and I thanked them for their generosity. I then called my office to see how things were going. Even in this sad time, I knew that I could not neglect my work. I spent the rest of the day in the agonizing process of organizing Felicia's memorial service. I felt I owed it to her friends and family as well as to herself. Then I spent another painful, sleepless night trying to figure out what happened, Ed. The next morning after breakfast, I was waiting in the room for my new lawyer. Hearing a timid knock on the door, I opened it and saw a young, fresh woman. Good morning, Mr. Salazar she said, holding out her hand. I'm Gina Ellerby, your lawyer. When she entered the room, I involuntarily stared at her. Jose warned me that she was young, but this woman looked like she had just graduated from high school. She was attractive enough, but she reminded me of one of those overweight starlets that the Disney Channel seems to churn out like clockwork. She turned around and caught my gaze. Is everything okay, Mr. Salazar? she asked in a high-pitched voice, like a little girl's. Excuse me, I said, but could you tell me how old you are? I understood that it was impolite of me, but I couldn't help myself. Her face turned red and she stood up straight, although that didn't help much. I know that I look younger than my age and that I have a child's voice, Mr. Salazar, but I'm 27 years old, graduated from law school, passed the bar exam, and was accepted to practice law in the state of Florida. Now, if that's not enough for you, I'll leave, and you'll find another lawyer to represent your interests, she said hotly. I raised my hands, stopping her at the same time, and apologizing for my rudeness. Sorry, Miss Ellerby, you just took me by surprise. Look, we got off to a bad start. Let's try again. My name is Andres Salazar, but my friends call me Andy. I would like you to represent me. She took a deep breath and extended her hand to shake mine. Apology accepted, she said. I'd like to call you Andy, and you can call me Gina. I look forward to working with you. So, Mr. Pasco has given me a brief summary of your situation, but I would like to hear more details from you. Well, I began. Felicia and I arrived here on Thursday. Oh, Andy, she interrupted. What am I thinking about? I'm so sorry for your wife. I wanted to say this when I entered. I nodded, 
At that moment, I had nothing more to say, except to thank her for her concern. I then briefly recounted the weekend's events, although I didn't talk about our little exchange with Don and Mia on Saturday night. For some reason, it seemed to me that talking about this would be a betrayal of Felicia's memory. While I read, Gina took notes, and when I finished, it was time to go. Gina volunteered to drive, and as we headed east, she said she didn't foresee any problems. I've already looked at the Coast Guard reports, and they show it was a boating accident. I believe that our meeting today is just routine to close the matter on this matter. You've had the misfortune of running into a couple of hillbillies, but don't worry. They'll behave differently around me. I felt better that Gina became my lawyer. She was clearly prepared, and I liked her attitude. And we arrived at the Inverness Sheriff's Office. Sheriff McGee himself wanted to talk to us. It soon became clear that this would not be a routine activity. He began by repeating the same questions his assistants had asked about my whereabouts on the day of the accident. I was very uncomfortable admitting that there was no way I could prove that I had been in the room all day. You say that you slept from about 10 a.m. until almost 4 p.m.? You must be very tired from last night, the sheriff noted, raising his eyebrows. I shifted uncomfortably in my chair. This was a place I wanted to avoid. Well, we danced for quite a long time in the nightclub, I said. He made a note on his notepad. So, how would you characterize your relationship with your late wife, Mr. Salazar? He asked, taking me by surprise. Okay, Sheriff, very good, I said quickly. I mean, we had our disagreements like any couple, but we had a great marriage. Gina gave me a sharp look, and I realized that she didn't like my answer. The sheriff nodded thoughtfully. So you were a happy and faithful husband? He asked, and I quickly nodded in agreement. Then why, Mr. Salazar, did the resort staff see you leaving the nightclub in the company of Mia Cavendish and not your wife? Why did you and her retreat to her beach cottage and not come out until the next morning? As I hemmed and hawed, I could see Gina's shocked expression out of the corner of my eye. I belatedly realized how suspicious my attempts to protect Felicia's reputation sounded. The only thing I could do now was to confess to this whole sweeping skirmish. Look, Sheriff, Felicia and I were talking about trying to spice up our love life a little, and when the opportunity arose with Don and Mia, we decided to give it a try. When I finished, I added, I hope you will be careful. Felicia's parents would be very upset to learn about this, especially now. I'm sure you understand. He didn't answer, but made another note on his notepad. Then he changed gear. Did you and Mrs. Salazar have insurance policies? He asked. I shook my head. No, we never bought them. I always thought it was a bad investment. So you won't gain anything financially if your wife dies unexpectedly? No way, I said angrily. Even the accident insurance provided by your wife's employer? He asked. Oh, I said in confusion, I completely forgot about that. I saw Gina looking at me with horror. I guess you forgot that your wife just last month increased the insurance payment on this policy to $1 million, the sheriff continued. Felicia said something about it, but I had no idea she increased the policy that much, I said hastily. Before I finished speaking, I realized how unconvincing it sounded. The sheriff moved on to another topic again. Let's go back to Mia Cavendish for a moment. How long have you known each other? I met her for the first time this weekend, I said quickly. Can you prove it, Mr. Salazar? He fired back. Before I could say anything, Gina interrupted the conversation. Come on, Sheriff, you know that it's impossible to prove a negative result. The Sheriff was on edge and clearly irritated by Gina's interference. Listen, girl, he began. But at these words, Gina's face flushed and she jumped up. The Sheriff also stood up, and Gina walked over to him and stood right in front of him. Sheriff McGee, I am a member of the bar and serve on the bench. Either you treat me with the respect I deserve or I will charge you. As she spoke, the sheriff involuntarily backed away from the angry young woman, but she continued to move forward until his back was pressed against the wall. She walked as close to him as she could without touching him, 
and the 250-pound man actually seemed intimidated by the tiny woman who was perhaps half his size. I think my client has had enough of your annoying and illogical questions for today, she continued. So unless you're going to arrest him and charge him with a crime, we'll leave. If you want to talk to him again, you know where to find me. The sheriff looked at me with a sly expression. No, you are free, Mr. Salazar. You can even return to Orlando, but don't even think about trying to leave the state of Florida. With these words, Gina turned, grabbed my hand, and almost dragged me out from the sheriff's office. When we got back onto the highway, I turned and looked at her. Wow! Remind me never to upset you. The way you treated the sheriff. Listen, she barked. I'm so close to giving up on your business. You never have to lie to me about anything again. I can't effectively represent you when you lie. Gina, I'm so sorry, I said humbly. I didn't intentionally lie to you. I felt bad about us switching wives, and I didn't want to ruin Felicia's reputation, or Mia's for that matter, and I honestly didn't know that Felicia had increased her insurance at work to a million dollars. Please, you have to believe me. For some time, she silently looked at the road. Okay, she finally said, I believe you. But don't hide anything like that from me anymore. Then she smiled slightly. Besides, the fact that you and your wife wanted to play doesn't make you a murderer. I am still convinced that it was a terrible accident. By then we had pulled into the resort and she pulled into the parking lot to let me out. I know that you need to return to Orlando. I will take care of everything here, and if there are any changes, I will contact you immediately. After I checked out of the hotel and headed back to Orlando, my thoughts turned to the sad days ahead. The first responsibility I had to face was a memorial service, and I knew how difficult it would be for me. Two days later, while I was in my office, the phone rang. It was Jose. Have you seen the internet news? He asked. When I told him no, he said, well, you'd better check your local office. But I warn you, you won't like what you see. Looks like someone played a cruel joke on you. I thanked Jose for the warning and went to check the online publication. When I clicked on local breaking news, the first headline I saw was Orlando Man Names Person of Interest in Wife's Death. The story not only contained details of the explosion, but also related to many of the details that the sheriff spoke about during our meeting. The reporter loosely used terms such as unexplained absence, possible motive, and sex games. Oh, damn, I said indignantly. Furious, I called Gina and attacked her. The sheriff must have passed all this on to the newspaper to put pressure on me. How can he do something like that? I demanded an answer. In addition, the story is full of hints and speculation. It reads like something out of the National Enquirer, not like a respectable newspaper. For that matter, I continued, if the sheriff believes that the explosion was not an accident, why is Don Cavendish not a suspect? He could get more than me. Forget about Cavendish, Gina told me. He's beyond suspicion. The sheriff told me he had a rock-solid alibi with six witnesses. He was on a long conference call the entire time, Gina explained. And all the other people on that call told the sheriff that Don was on the whole time. I wasn't satisfied. This means nothing. Cavendish could be talking on his cell phone. He could be anywhere. Gina sighed. But he was there, Andy. The building from which he called has CCTV cameras installed in the corridors. The recording showed that Don entered the building before the call began and did not leave until the end of the call. And before you ask, the windows in the building are intact. Hearing my frustrated grunt, Gina continued, Andy, I'm absolutely sure it was a terrible accident. I think the sheriff is snooping around because he's trying to do a thorough job, or maybe he's just been watching too many detective shows on TV. Be that as it may, I'm sure that this whole matter will soon be closed and you will be completely acquitted. Maybe, I grumbled, but for now they make me out to be my wife's murderer. There wasn't much else in the news for the next few days, but now I was really afraid to go to the memorial service. Not only will I have to come to terms with my pain and loss, but there are also all these rumors and suspicions. I wanted to hide, but that would make me look even worse. Besides, I told myself, I owe it to Felicia. 
The service was as bad as I feared. The priest's sermon gave me little comfort, and the panegyrics were painful. When my turn came, I couldn't stand it and was forced to stop mid-sentence. When I tried to talk about some of our happy times together, I choked up and all I could say was, I miss you, Felicia, before leaving the pulpit. Even though a lot of people came to the service, I noticed that after that much fewer people came to the reception area. Instead, people huddled in small groups talking quietly among themselves. I could only guess what they were talking about. At some point, I saw Felicia's family standing to the side. Her father gave me a dark look, and I wished I could say something to him that would reassure him that I had not harmed his beloved daughter. Then her mother came over and quickly hugged me. We know that you loved her, Andres. As soon as this all settles down, you should come to us. It made me feel a little better, but I wondered how long it would be until this all blows over. The one thing I especially remember about this service was that my entire football team was there, which really meant a lot to me. The last of the group was Domingo, our striker. He was small, but fast, like summer lightning. He came up and hugged me. Hey, Andres, hold on, hombre. We all know you didn't do anything. He smiled widely. You're a damn boy scout. In all the games we've played, you've never gotten a red card. I couldn't help but smile as I thanked him. I just wanted others to have the same confidence in me. A week after the memorial service, I was working in my office when Gina Ellerby walked through the door. Gina, what are you doing here? I asked in surprise. I have some information for you, so I decided to come to you if you are not too busy. No, no, not at all, I said. I'm glad you're here. I just didn't want to cause you any inconvenience. What did you find out? She told me she went to the sheriff and asked it how the reporter knew about the sheriff's investigation. I asked him if he had taken a second job at Sentinel, she said, but he denied any involvement. But he admitted that he recorded the interview and that someone else could have heard it, she said. I thought about the two sheriff's deputies and decided that one of them was the likely culprit. I didn't like it, but there was little I could do. The cat was out of the bag, and all I could hope for was that my name would be cleared as soon as possible. But when Gina showed up in my office again a week later, my hopes for a quick vindication were dashed. The sheriff let me know that they found some new evidence, she said, and it was clear from the expression on her face that this was not very good. Chris Craft cans washed ashore, she said. Your fingerprints were all over them. I shook my head irritably. Of course it is. It doesn't mean anything, I told her. When Don and I were loading the boat to go fishing on Friday, I brought him extra fuel on board. Of course my fingerprints will be all over these cans, she nodded. I believe you, Andy. It just doesn't look very good. If I were a prosecutor confronting a jury... I would tell them that there are three requirements to prove a crime. Motive, means, and opportunity. Felicia's insurance provides an obvious motive. Your fingerprints on those jars indicate that you had funds, and the fact that you have no alibi for the six hours on the day this happened suggests possibility. But I've already explained what happened in all three cases, I objected. I know, she replied, and that's probably why they didn't press any charges. But I have seen cases where juries have reached a verdict based on evidence that was not much more reliable than this. I looked at her with alarm and despair. This is turning into a nightmare. What do I need to do to convince people that I have nothing to do with this? She thought for a minute. The weakest link in this case is the question of your whereabouts on Sunday afternoon. The resort manager told me that the sheriff's people interviewed all the employees to see if anyone had noticed you during this time. But no one saw you. Because I slept in my room, I shouted. But no one knows this. I'm stuck with having to prove the negative. Gina began to pace around the room. There must be some way to prove that you didn't leave the room. After a pause, she asked, Aren't all the doors at the resort opened with a card key? Won't the resort record every time someone enters the room? No, I said. Card keys don't work like that. Each door lock is a self-contained unit programmed to respond to a specific code on the card. The code is valid only for this door and only for the duration of the guest's stay. But the locks are not connected to anything. In fact, to change the codes on a lock, you need to insert a special device into it. 
Then I gulped as an idea struck me. But I recently read an article that described some new systems that actually communicate with a central computer so that the hotel has a record of all the comings and goings. Paradiso is a completely new first-class resort. I wonder if it is possible that he has such a system. It was a faint hope, but it was all I had. So I grabbed the phone and called the resort. The manager remembered my name, and when I explained my question, he began to understand why I was so excited. Paradiso is a modern establishment in every respect, he told me, including our card system. Why didn't you say anything earlier? I demanded an answer. To be honest, I have never worked in a hotel with such a system before, and with the preview and the official opening, we were so busy that I didn't even think about it. But apparently, the system is working. I'll go check it out. A few minutes later, he picked up the phone again. You might be lucky, Mr. Salazar. The system is working, and we have data on the server from previous weekends. Please take care of these notes. They are vitally important to me, I begged him. We will come to you as soon as we can. Gina and I drove our cars to Crystal River as fast as we could. If the Florida State Police had been in the area, I'm sure we would have been arrested. Luckily, they all must have been guarding tourists, so we arrived without incident. When we burst into the resort, the manager was already waiting for us. He led us to where the computer system was located and pulled out a stack of printouts he had made for us. Gina and I looked at them in confusion and could not understand what was happening. Each page represents a separate date, the manager told us. Here, he continued, pointing to the column heading, is time. Room numbers are located on a horizontal axis. The code in the table indicates the status, open or closed, and whether the card key was used. Gina looked at him confused. How can you open a door without a key? Whether they open from the inside, he explained. He turned a few pages and pointed to a row of lines. Here is a recording of the number that Mr. Salazar had on our preliminary weekend. You can see all the arrivals and departures for each day. And here, he said, turning to the next page, is the report for that Sunday. As you can see, the door was opened without a key shortly before 8.30 a.m., presumably when you and your wife came down for breakfast. I glanced at Gina. I didn't want her to tell the manager that Don Cavendish was in the room. Here, he continued, you see that the door was opened with a card key at 9.57 in the morning. About 30 minutes later, the door opened without a key, probably when your wife left the room. After this, you can see that the door did not open again until 3.56 p.m. I turned to Gina. But that doesn't help us at all. I could leave the room with Felicia at 10.30 but Gina danced happily. But if you left then, how could you return to the room when the messenger found you there at four o'clock? Don't you understand? You had to be in the room the whole time. This proves that you were telling the truth about your whereabouts on Sunday. I opened my eyes wide and hugged her. You're a genius, Gina. Then I turned to the manager. Can we take this? He replied that he printed them out, especially for us. With a printout in hand, we rushed to the sheriff's office in Inverness. Sheriff McGee was just about to leave when we pulled into the parking lot. Gina opened the car door and ran up, waving the printout in her hand. Sheriff, Sheriff, she shouted. We have evidence. He got out of the car, and she laid out the papers on the hood. She readily explained what they were and what they depicted. The sheriff looked at the printouts with suspicion but seemed to understand what we were trying to explain about the resort's key card system. This proves that Andy was in his room all this time. There was no way he could leave without leaving a note in the system. Don't you see that this proves that the explosion was just a terrible accident, nothing more? The sheriff looked at the printout for a few minutes, then collected the pages and put them in the car. I'll have to take a closer look at them, and I want to talk to the resort manager too. He got behind the wheel and turned on the ignition. Then he rolled down the window. If this turns out to be true, he said reluctantly, you've done well, girl. This time Gina was so pleased that she didn't even react. When the sheriff drove away, she turned around and hugged me. I think we did it, she said. I hugged her back. You're a genius, Gina, I repeated. 
This calls for a holiday. Let me invite you to dinner. You name the place yourself. Gina took us to McLeod House Bistro, a 100-year-old house in Inverness that has been converted into a restaurant. We had a leisurely dinner on the deck under the canopy, and while we ate, I took the opportunity to learn more about Gin. I found out that she went to a second-rate law school here in Florida. If she had earned any honors, such as law review or argumentative trial, she did not mention them. She passed the bar on her second try, she admitted, but couldn't find a job at a law firm. But she didn't give up, as I already found out, so she started practicing on her own. It was a real struggle for the first year or so, but someone must have given her a good recommendation because she began taking on all the legal work involved in developing a new resort outside of Crystal River. She embarrassedly admitted that this was her first criminal case. Her personal life was equally unremarkable. Apparently she had a boyfriend, but she hadn't seen him for a long time and didn't want to talk about him. At the same time, it was clear that she did not have much income, so she did not leave the house often. She didn't have many friends in the area, so she led a rather secluded life. As I listened to her, I came to the conclusion that she was not the most astute lawyer I had ever met. Additionally, I felt that her girlish appearance and girlish voice were major barriers that made it much more difficult for potential clients to take her seriously. But she was energetic, honest, and decisive. That is, she possessed those virtues that I admired, more importantly, it seemed her persistence led to the discovery of evidence that could take me out of Sheriff McGee's crosshairs. And I had to admit that she was really nice and funny, even if she looked more like a college freshman than a practicing lawyer. I liked her, and at the same time, I felt a little sorry for her. After dinner, I told her I had to go back to Orlando, but she asked me to go to her place for coffee. This will help you stay awake on the way back, she said and I relented because I really felt obliged to her. When we got back to her house, she gave me a little tour that ended in the bedroom. I half expected to see boy band posters on her walls. Thank God there weren't any. But she had a teddy bear on her bed. As I turned to go back into the living room, she grabbed my arm and stopped me. Andy, she said very seriously, I want you to fire me. I was shocked. Why, Gina? I don't understand. She smiled shyly at me. Because if you don't, it will be a violation of legal ethics. With these words, she pulled me towards her, stood on tiptoes, and kissed me passionately on the lips. I hadn't been with a woman since Mia Cavendish, and Gina was definitely desirable, but I forced myself to stop and push her away slightly. Gina, are you sure? What about your boyfriend? And how about but she put her fingers to my mouth to stop me. It's okay, she said, breathless. I really want this. We made love. The next morning at breakfast, she was visibly happy, humming to herself, even stopping to do a little dance move for me. I was glad that she didn't feel any guilt about our night. She gave me a smug smile. Well, what does it feel like to be above suspicion in your wife's death? The look on my face must have made her realize how it sounded, and she started to apologize, but I stopped her. It's okay, Gina, I understand what you mean. But the thing is, I'm still worried about what actually happened there. Sheriff McGee seemed so convinced that a crime had been committed, and I wonder if he was right. Oh, Andy, you can't let this eat away at you. It was simply a tragic accident, just as the Coast Guard report said. Perhaps, I said, but the fact remains... Don Cavendish received a lot of money from the death of his wife, and it seems a bit far-fetched that he had such a perfect alibi, created at the right time with witnesses who weren't even in the same place. Do you even realize how paranoid that sounds? Gina asked impatiently. The cameras in Don's office showed him arriving at the office and remaining there until the end of the conference call, that is, after the explosion. Do you know where this office building is? I asked. I'd like to go take a look at it. Gina rolled her eyes but agreed to take me there. When we got to the address, I saw a nondescript two-story commercial building offering a number of office suites for rent. With Gina in tow, I reluctantly walked around the building. There were only two entrances, one in front, the other in back. 
They were connected by a long corridor. Fixed commercial windows provided light. There seemed to be no other way out. We returned to the main entrance and entered the lobby. At that moment, a security guard came out of one of the rooms and approached us. How can I help you guys? He asked. Gina wanted to say something, but I grabbed her hand. My colleague and I are looking for office space. By the way, is there an open office there that we could look into to see if they will meet our needs? We would be very grateful. Of course, he said. There's no one in 115. Come on, I'll let you in. As we followed the guard down the hallway, Gina gave me a sharp look, but I ignored it. A friendly guard unlocked the door and held it for us. Don't be shy, look around. When you leave, the door will automatically close. He then continued his rounds. The office was unremarkable, and Gina asked, What are you looking for? I don't know, I said. I'll know when I see it. We walked through a small reception area into one of the offices. It had a floor-to-ceiling window with blinds inserted between the panes. I walked over to the window and leaned over to take a closer look. When I read the logo on the small sticker in the bottom right corner of the window frame, I jumped with excitement and turned to Gina. I know this manufacturer, I said. I use their windows in one of my projects. So what? She asked. What does it matter? I pointed to her purse. Do you happen to have a nail file? When she handed me the nail file, I walked over to the window and pointed to the small hole in the lower left corner. The building manager has a special key for this, but the manufacturer's representative showed me how to do it if the key is lost. With these words, I bent down, inserted a nail file into the slot, and twisted it. Hearing the click, I stood up, put my hand on the edge of the window, and pushed. The window quickly swung open. One edge turned outside the building, the other inside the office. Gina gasped. I smiled triumphantly. This is called a center pivot window. This allows cleaners to clean both sides of the window without having to go outside, which is a major advantage for upper floors. But it also makes it possible for someone on the ground floor to sneak out of the building without using the hallway. I closed the window and locked it again. Returning the nail file to her, I took her hand. Let's go. We have to try to find the sheriff. Wait! Gina shouted so sharply that I froze. Andy, think about what you're doing. What are you going to tell the sheriff? That Don Cavendish was physically able to leave this building undetected? Okay, but we have no evidence that he actually did it, and there is no evidence that he somehow got to the boat and caused the explosion. There's really no evidence that anything happened other than the horrific accident that the Coast Guard report shows. Listen, she continued, the sheriff didn't arrest you because the circumstantial evidence wasn't strong enough. He, of course, is not going to arrest a prominent businessman from Oakley on even weaker evidence. She took my hand. Andy, I know that you are upset with your wife and outraged by the accusations against you, but you'll look even worse if you start talking about murder without good reason. It was an accident. Just let him go. I knew that there was a lot of truth in her words, but my intuition told me that I was not mistaken. I looked at Gina. Okay. I'll stay away from Sheriff McGee for now, but I want to talk to Cavendish and hear what he has to say. Gina stared at the floor. You can't do this, Andy, she said quietly. Why not? I demanded an answer. Because he left town, she said. I tried to contact him to get some information, and his office told me that he had left Ocala and left for an indefinite period. You see? I shouted. It means he has something to hide. She looked at me sadly. Andy, go back to Orlando. Take care of your business. Try to start a new life. If you just accept the fact that Felicia died in a tragic accident, you'll be much happier. Then she came up to me and kissed me tenderly. Please, Andy, I really care about you. I don't want to see you waste your life on conspiracy theories. As I drove back to Orlando, my mind was racing. Despite what Gina said, it seemed to me that there were too many coincidences for it to be an accident. Cavendish just had a meeting that prevented him from going out on the yacht. But colleagues from another city called, 
who could only confirm that he was in touch and not that he was in his office. And there were also these cans of gasoline. Don just happened to take the cooler full of beer, so I had to carry the cans and leave my fingerprints on them. And Mia just kept me up all night, so the next day I was completely exhausted. No, wait, that can't be true. That would mean Mia was involved in her own death. I shook my head wearily. I just couldn't put all the pieces together. Maybe Gina was right. Maybe I just need to let it go. The next week I threw myself into work. I had a lot to do anyway, but I also hoped that by focusing on my business, I could take my mind off things. It worked to some extent, but at night I found myself, I'm drawing diagrams and graphs, trying to come up with a reasonable scenario. On Thursday, I was just finishing up a project when I heard someone enter my office. Looking up, I was surprised to see Gina standing there in a beautiful dress, holding something behind her back. Gina, I said, what are you doing here? She held her hand out in front of her to show a bottle of champagne. I'm here to celebrate with you, she said with a smile. The sheriff has officially closed the investigation into the explosion. Officially, this is considered an accident at sea. You're off the hook, Andy. I walked around the table to stand next to her. This is good news, Gina. I really appreciate everything you've done for me. Then he took the bottle of champagne from her hands and put it on the table. Taking her hands in mine, I looked at her carefully. What's going on, Gina? Why are you really here? The overly cheerful smile disappeared from her face, replaced by a more serious expression. I wanted to see you again, Andy. Don't worry, I don't love you, but you and I have a lot in common. We're lonely, we're both bereaved, she looked at me with a shy smile, and we're both excited. I'll leave if you want, but I thought we could help each other, at least for one night. She was right. I didn't mean to fall in love with her, especially so soon after losing Felicia. But I didn't really have anyone to help me through the loneliness, and if I was honest with myself, I was horny. I smiled at her. I have an idea. Why don't you come to my place and I'll cook dinner for the two of us? Her happy smile made me happy. While Gina wandered around my apartment sipping champagne, I started preparing dinner. I'm not a very good chef, but I make scampi with black beans and rice. I had some peeled shrimp in the refrigerator that I brushed with oil while the grill was heating up. Gina helped me by mashing the garlic into a paste for mojo. I cheated with black beans after opening a can from the store, but with spices, onions, and peppers, they still tasted great. By the time everything was ready, we were both very hungry and quickly finished our food. I deliberately steered the conversation away from the events that brought us together, especially avoiding mention of my suspicions about Don Cavendish. This would only provoke a quarrel, and I did not want any conflicts. Everything seemed to be going well until, after dinner, I made the mistake of asking Gina how her law practice was going. Her face fell, and I belatedly realized that perhaps one of the reasons she had come to Orlando was because she had escaped from the office. She tearfully told me that the work she was getting at the resort had dried up and that she was having a hard time making ends meet. I also suspected that she hadn't heard anything from her boyfriend, and their relationship, or lack thereof, was taking a toll on her. I couldn't say much to encourage her, but I hugged her and tried to support her. After a while, she raised her head and kissed me as a sign of gratitude, after which we made love again. We both dozed off and woke up only in the early morning. She pulled me towards her again, and I happily complied. I may not be in love with her, but she was a sweet and sexy woman. I couldn't help but admire her. When we were lying in bed later, she sat up and became more serious. I have to tell you something, and I tensed, wondering what would happen next. She looked almost embarrassed. I think I know where Don Cavendish is, she said. Where? I asked, sitting up in bed, my heart beating faster. I went to the resort to see if they had a job for me, and in the office I noticed a package in the outgoing mail with Don's name on it. The address was in Lake Tahoe. I wrote this down for you. I started to get out of bed but she grabbed my hand. There's something else, she said, but I'm not sure what it means. I found out that Don's business is a major investor in Paradiso. I started getting dressed. 
I don't know what that means either, but I do know that I'm going to Tahoe. I have to get to Cavendish and find out what really happened. Wait, said Gina. I want to go with you. No, I said sharply. This is my concern, not yours. Besides, if my suspicions are correct, this could get dangerous. You need to go back to Inverness. I'll let you know what I find out. She reluctantly agreed and soon left. I called my office to let them know I wouldn't be there and then started checking flights to Lake Tahoe. The best option was to fly to Reno. The flight departed mid-morning. I hurried to the airport to make it on time. When my plane finally arrived at Reno Tahoe International Airport, I discovered that I had made one strategic faux pas. I didn't check the weather. An early snowstorm enveloped the entire area. For a guy who had lived in sunny Florida all his life, this was a real problem. However, I swore that I would not be intimidated. Many other people have adapted to the snow, and I will have to do the same. Luckily, I was able to rent a 444 at the airport and paid extra for a set of chains. Then I went shopping in Reno. By the time I finished my business, it was already quite late, so I found a cheap motel and settled in with some takeout. I decided it would be wiser to head to Lake Tahoe in the morning light. After breakfast, I headed south on I-580, then turned west on Nevada 431. The roads were plowed and the traffic had melted most of the remaining snow, so I was moving pretty quickly. As I approached Galena Creek Park, I stopped and put chains on my tires because the snow on the road was getting thicker as I climbed. The Mount Rose Highway was a nightmare. Heavy snowfall, sharp turns, and constant incline. I wondered about the tall red posts along the highway until I realized they were there to guide the snowplows. My God, I thought, is the snow really that deep? Finally, I started to make my way down to Lake Tahoe. In some ways, going down the slope was even scarier because I knew that if I lost traction, I could very well end up in an icy lake. But I finally made it safely into South Lake Tahoe early in the day. It took me three hours to drive 40 miles. I was exhausted, so I stopped by Mont Bleu, one of the first large hotel casinos I came across along the way. After checking into my room and resting a bit, I rented an SUV and went looking for the Cavendish address Gina had given me. The GPS guided me up the hill until I arrived at a Swiss-style chalet with a breathtaking view of the lake. My builder's eye told me that this place must be almost 10,000 square feet, making it the largest chalet I had ever seen. But as the snow fell harder and it got dark quickly, I didn't want to risk making a mistake in the dark and being discovered, or worse. So I headed back to Mont Blanc. Once there, I went to my room and ate a burger and beer while watching football on the big screen TV. They showed the Miami game, and I was pleased to see the Hurricanes attack the opponent. After the game, I decided to check out the casino before heading up to my room. Despite the weather, there were a lot of people there. Walking through the room, I glanced at the blackjack table and almost gasped out loud. Don Cavendish was there, and judging by the size of the pile of chips in front of him, he was doing well. For that matter, judging by the tall, long-haired blonde standing behind him, he was doing quite well in this area as well. She was sexy enough to be a woman of easy virtue, but you never know. Guys with that kind of money attract attractive women like sugar attracts ants. I didn't want to meet him yet, so I stood behind a group of people and watched. After some time, he collected his winnings and, together with his companion, headed to the cash register window. Stick to the plan, I told myself. Wait until tomorrow. With these words, I headed upstairs to my room, but it was not easy to fall asleep. In fact, meeting Cavendish again brought back a swarm of painful memories. At the same time, I couldn't stop thinking about what tomorrow might bring. I don't know when I fell asleep, but I know it was already late. The next morning, after a quick breakfast, I returned to my room to prepare for the meeting. In Reno, I walked into a sporting goods store and bought a combination of skiing and mountaineering gear that the salesman swore would keep me warm. I decided that I would need it. In addition, in Reno, I visited a gun show that I learned about from the internet. There, I bought a machine gun. With a machine gun in my pocket, I packed my bags and left the room. I decided that one way or another I would not return to the casino. I was in a gloomy mood as I prepared. Seeing how much snow had fallen overnight made my mood even darker. 
I carefully approached Cavendish's nest, grateful for the chains on the tires. I decided to park around the bend in the road so he wouldn't notice my SUV. I didn't notice any tire tracks on the road. Assuming Cavendish went home last night, he should still be there. The smoke rising from its chimney gave me even more confidence that I had timed it right. Even though his house was only a hundred yards away, the climb up the hill was difficult because of the snow. I was out of breath when I reached his house and hid behind the trees. The home security system looked good, but after working in construction, I knew a thing or two about how it was installed and how to hack it without causing an alarm. It only took me a couple of minutes of work with a pry bar and a screwdriver, which I brought with me. Then I took a deep breath. The time has come. The window I forced open opened into an unoccupied guest bedroom. What was even better was that the carpet on the floor muffled my footsteps. I carefully opened the door and looked out into the long corridor. The light came from one end, and I headed in that direction. As I reached the end of the carpeted corridor, I noticed Cavendish sitting at the dining table looking through some papers. But when I entered the living room, the floorboard creaked and he raised his head. He jumped to his feet, but I pointed the gun at him and ordered him to stay put. When I got close enough for him to see me, his face broke into a cheeky grin. Well, well, Andy Salazar, you're the last person I expected to see here. Come on, Cavendish, I growled. I know that you blew up the boat and I know how you did it. He just stared at me and I continued, trying to shake his confidence. Conference calling was easy. With a mobile phone, you could answer that call from anywhere and your colleagues would never know. Figuring out how you faked the video from the office building was more difficult until I went there and saw the central hinged windows. Not many people realize how easy it is to open them if you know the trick. I saw a twinkle in his eye and thought I might have gotten him. Getting to the yacht must have been a piece of cake. There was probably a motorboat waiting for you. No, he said arrogantly. It was a scooter. Even faster and easier to hide. And since I was wearing a wetsuit, no one recognized me. But why did you do it? You already had a fortune. How much do you need? Now it was his turn to frown angrily. This is where you are wrong, Salazar. All the money was in Mia's name. She insisted on a prenuptial agreement when we got married and used it to keep me on a short leash. I wanted her dead almost as much as I wanted her money. Then his smile returned and became even wider than before. Of course, money wasn't the only thing I wanted. At that moment, I felt the barrel of a gun press into my neck. You'll live much longer if you put the gun on the floor, whispered a voice behind me. In desperation, I bent down and put the machine gun on the floor. Kick him, came the command, and I kicked him away from Cavendish. At least he won't have it on hand. The bandit backed away from me and began circling around the room, ending up next to Cavendish. Seeing the long blonde hair, I cursed at my own stupidity. Crap! I never thought she could still be here. Cavendish was grinning from ear to ear. You still don't understand, Andy? He nudged the blonde, and she reached up to her head with her other hand and began fiddling with her hair. After a minute, she grabbed her golden locks and pulled them completely off her head, revealing short black hair in a pixie cut. Oh my God. Felicia! I gasped, almost reeling from this sight. She smiled at Cavendish. See, Don, I told you that this is a good disguise. I was shocked. Have you been part of this the whole time? I asked incredulously. She looked at me triumphantly. Who do you think put a double dose of sleeping pills in your breakfast on Sunday morning? Who do you think increased my insurance to give you a motive? Who do you think put even more sleeping pills in the cocktail I made for that bitch Mia so she won't cause us any trouble when Don comes out to the boat? Now Cavendish was showing off. It was so simple. By the time I got to the yacht, Mia had already fallen asleep, so it was easy for me to hoist her on board and throw her off. Then I planted a bomb in the engine compartment, and Felicia and I got the hell out of there. I dropped her off at the bay, where the car was waiting for us, then went back to Crystal River and slipped into the building without anyone noticing. The explosion explained the disappearance of the women, and the evidence against you cleared me of suspicion. 
trying to understand what they were talking about, I muttered. But this means that all this was supposed to happen. Oh, yes, my dear husband, Felicia interrupted. We fell in love soon after I started doing PR for Paradiso. When Don told me about his problem with Mia, we began looking for ways to deal with it. We decided that an accident at sea would be the perfect way to get rid of her and let me disappear at the same time, she said smugly. Oh, she added, and the preview was my idea. It worked great to get you to the resort where we could pull it off. I was stunned. But why, Felicia, why did you do this? I thought we were happy together. You loved me so much at the resort. How could you do this? Her face flushed, and there was a wild look in her eyes. In an almost manic voice, she screamed, You know why? I already told you. I will never be poor again. I recoiled from her vehemence. I never realized how deeply her childhood had distorted her character. Felicia seemed to regain her composure as she walked over and hugged Cavendish. Now that Mia is out of the way and everyone thinks I'm dead, we'll never have to worry about money again. I love him and we can be together forever. No! A voice shouted from the corridor, and I looked back in surprise to see Gina standing there. She looked very young in the pink jumpsuit, but the gun she was holding in her hand was real. Tears streamed down Gina's face. It's not true, she shouted to Felicia. Don loves me. He promised me that he would divorce Mia and we could be together. I stared at her in amazement. Was Don your boyfriend? But her attention was focused solely on Cavendish. You said you loved me. You promised... Cavendish's grin returned. Did I say that I love you, Gina? I'm afraid I took a little poetic license. But you were with me? You made promises, Gina protested, already sobbing. Oh, my dear, you should already know that men are ready to do anything to seduce a young woman. While I enjoyed our flirtation, what I really wanted was your skills, or lack thereof, as a lawyer. I kept you in business with legal work for Paradiso so you'd be around to represent good old Andy after I made sure no other lawyer would do it. I figured that after you failed at Paradiso, our boy would be convicted based on circumstantial evidence. But you couldn't even do that right, could you? No, you're just a stupid, immature little girl. At these words, Gina's pain gave way to rage, and she screamed, Don't call me a little girl. She probably accidentally pulled the trigger and shot at Don. Felicia screamed and shot Gina. Felicia turned and knelt next to Don, crying and shaking him. I decided that this was my only chance and ran to her. I jumped to my feet and threw the gun away from her. I rushed Lo Jin to see if I could help, but there was no pulse in her neck or wrist. Poor little Gina, what a shame, I thought sadly. I walked back to Felicia and stood looking down at her. Through her tears, she reached out her hand to grab my pant leg. Help me, Andy, she begged. Help me, Corazon. I pulled the pants out of her hands. It's too late, Futa, I said with a grin. Then he took out his cell phone and dialed 911. Having given the telephone operator the address, I told her that it would be better for her to send not only an ambulance, but also the police. There has been a double murder. I said, and assured her that I would be waiting to let them into the house. Then I sat down in front of the window and began to look at large flakes of wet snow softly falling onto the lake. The scenery was beautiful, but I prefer the sand and ocean. I reached into my other pocket and pulled out a miniature recording device I had bought in Reno. It only took a few clicks of buttons to make sure it captured everything that happened. I put it on the table to give it to the police. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.